Hello, I hope you can hear me clearly all right. So I recently picked up a book by Judith Butler, one of her earlier works. And in case you are not familiar with who she is, she is in many ways considered a um, leading intellectual in the field of gender studies. And she has had various famous debates with um, other recognized philosophers and critics. But that's not why I picked up The Psychic Life of Power, published in 1997. There is a reason why I, I picked up this book, and that is because it is one of the earliest texts that I could find in the post-Althusserian oeuvre, which directly engages the question of subjection. Now, I suppose I could say something introductorily regarding what is subjection, but I believe what the most instructive answer would be to would be to relay an example used by I think Althusser himself regarding the situation where on a street a policeman calls you and in the call you recognize yourself in it. Um all of that aside. Subjection is not something that merely happens in public spaces between uh, recognized publicly instituted uh, officers and things of that nature. It happens within the family, within classrooms, within organizations, in any kind of job that a society institutes or recognizes there is an acknowledgement of roles, an idea of accountability arises from there, an understanding of expectations, um, debts, bonds, obligations. The nexus which makes these um, nodes meaningful is in a sense a question of subjection, which is why I think it's relevant. It's something that's studied, of course, in uh, by psychoanalysts, but also by sociologists. But without any further introduction, let me get to the presentation of my notes. In the introduction, we are informed that the project of the text is to think a theory of the psyche in conjunction with a theory of power. In thinking the reflexive subject, turning in on itself in relation to power, what we see whited over or invisibilized is the determinacy of the subject's perception. Now this is of course a note that I make. Uh, and there is something to be said here. I think there are ways in which we may get um, mired in a modeling of the relation between the subject vis-a-vis -vis power, whether it is done in historical terms, whether it's done in contemporary uh, political terms, whether it's done topographically. And what gets um, sadly blanketed over here is the question of narrative, or rather, what does the subject perceive? And this would be interest of any kind of for any kind of debriefing or report that is to arise from such a subject. And which is why I think it's important that it's pointed out initially in the beginning itself. In other words, in what form did the subject encounter power which prompted this turning in on itself? This, when glossed over, is a silencing of narrative. There seems to be a way in which Judith Butler recognizes the construction of a self's preferences to be built upon a fundamental foreclosure, such as an infant's resistance to parents, siblings, etc. In a sense, we begin to define who we are in opposition in relation to those that we encounter around us. Who may have been the parents and siblings, 
who may have been his or her earliest objects of love. The I to have autonomous preferences almost rests on that foreclosure, as it were. This also creates a psychic circuit, as it were, predicated upon the reappearance of the impossible love via some mechanism of transference which seems to be the only outlet for the individual's subject formation, perhaps sublimated, sexualized, and via other means. Now let me repeat this sentence and I believe there's a way in which it ties into what I was trying to broach earlier in my video regard in my earlier video regarding the place of philosophy. Um, this foreclosure as it were creates a psychic circuit. This foreclosure regarding what it is that I am not. The oppositions vis-a-vis whom I retroactively define myself, or rather, as I once said, my disengagement from a certain situation allows me to self-consciously reflect on what my place here is in terms of what it is that I may be doing. And of course, this permits for certain forms of subject formations, and which may be sublimated or sexualized or perhaps engaged in some other manner deemed agreeable by the subject in question. Yet the I is also conditioned by the spectre of the reappearance of this impossible love. And I think Lacan speaks of this as the, the barred subject, but I'm not very clear about that, so I won't get into it. A development which is a development which it will take every measure to resist. If the subject is produced through foreclosure, this is a quote, then the subject is produced by a condition from which it is by definition separated and differentiated. And I guess you would be able to say that, you know, in the early life of an infant, they begin to start recognizing themselves, their bodies, their associations and feelings as distinct from that of their earliest primary caregiver, the mother, and so on. Would that which is foreclosed then persist as a memory, perhaps embodied in an artifact such as a document or a photograph, or would its repression congeal into some sort of trauma the subject compulsively doesn't think about? Now, while introducing the idea of an infant and their early subject formation, it's important, it's important to consider, or rather, it's important to remind oneself of the fact that this is merely a uh, a hypothetical zero stage and we are all in many ways subjects in formation. We um, leave homes, we go to workplaces, we migrate to new cities and there are reasons which impel us to do so. And in a way there is a choice that we make which determines a certain course of our becoming and Judith Butler isn't necessarily speaking about a baby here but literally um, a subject in the philosophical sense, as a person who is self-consciously able to make decisions and provide reasons to oneself for those. And yet in the reasoning for these decisions, there may be an aspect which one finds, let us say, for the lack of a better word, traumatic, a reason why we chose not to, for example, eat shellfish after uh, it was found to be allergic or something of that kind. In continuing, the relation or rather the dependence of the self or power is one way to think of subjection. Let me repeat that. 
the relation or rather the dependence of the self on power is one way to think of subjection. Yet Butler insists that the I emerges upon the condition that it deny its formation in dependency. And in a sense you can get an idea of how the idea of autonomy of self-expression cannot hinge upon an idea of dependency because that would dissolve the sense of self that a person may seek to posit for themselves. It is with disruption by such a denial, a materialist metaphysics if there ever was one, but without incident or biography. Or is the place of the narrative implicated by the subjection of the self? Is this what the author is getting at? Now this is more like a question to myself. And why do I call it a materialist metaphysics? Because the forms in which the subject encounters the modulations of power are not predicated and yet they are described as interruptions, which is a way in which a subject will always encounter a quote-unquote foreign agency. And this is why I say that the, the place of the narrative seemingly um, is pulled out from underneath the rug. Um, or as I put it, is the place of the narrative implicated by the subjection of the self? I mean, what is, what does it mean to try and think about how the self is constructed? And why is it a question that is of relevance to us? Is it in some ways changing or impacting how we consider the narrative? Like perhaps a prime influence on Judith Butler might have once placed it before us, such as the idea of epistemic breaks in history or rather moments where the predominant logic was forced to reconsider how it organizes the arrangement of knowledges before its consideration. Now, not all of these were as dramatic as the shift from the, uh, uh, the geocentric to the heliocentric model of the universe and things of that nature, but many of them in various fields did force us to reorganize how we consider our relation to what it is that we know. But this is not to be the focus of this uh, particular presentation. I will continue to present my notes on the introduction to the psychic life of power. A sense of subjection is entailed in our conception for who does one speak for. In other words, who do we recognize to be the addressee of a call? This question is materialized, as it were, when we begin to consider, as structuralism did, the possibility of not identifying the subject with an individual or entity, but with a linguistic category, placeholder or structure in formation. A prominent example of this kind of thought, of course, being Althusser's turn from any determinism in the dictum, history is a process without a subject. Such a consideration opens up a new dimension in the subject, as it were, where we may notice that instead of being simply a positive or negative entity with certain qualities, attributes or their absences, it becomes a site of contestation for these qualities, attributes and their negation. This of course would raise the issue of the product of attributes in conjunction and what kind of extensionality may account for this. And here I suppose you may be getting a sense of why I try to describe some of these kinds of questioning as a materialist metaphysics. 
In introducing her book, The Psychic Life of Power, Judith Butler appears to grasp the paradox of a subject trying to narrate its own genesis. The subject can refer to its own genesis only by taking a third person perspective on itself, that is, by dispossessing its own perspective in the act of narrating it. Or in the act of narrating its genesis, if you prefer. On the other hand, the narration of how the subject is constituted presupposes that the constitution has already taken place and thus arrives after the fact. This does seem to spell out the problem of narration quite nicely, yet a preliminary clause may be placed, particularly given that we are dealing with an explicitly philosophical work. Instead of presupposing the subject for which an account is offered, would not a narrative, in order for it to be convincing, have to account for or rather posit the presuppositions which allow for such a recollection? Let me repeat this. Instead of presupposing the subject for which an account is offered, or rather instead of thinking that the subject would have to, you know, remove itself from the position of its own narration in order to explain its own genesis, would it not make sense to be able to allow the subject to say what permitted such a gaze in the first place? So in, for instance, if I were to make a video, there's a webcam which allows me to create a recording which makes a memory which can be broadcasted and so on. Yet there may be a memory which I draw upon in the recollection of, a, of an event which I may have to explain, such as I was in X and Y place at a certain point in time and things of that nature. Just going over it once again in case you have another reading. Instead of presupposing the subject for which an account if offered is offered, would not a narrative, in order for it to be convincing, have to account for or rather posit the presuppositions which allow for such a recollection? The categories utilized here would hence be a productive synthesis of the subject's reflection, unlike perhaps a circular presupposing of the subject itself. And I think Kant in many ways is the person who does nail it here, saying that we would have to presuppose, you know, time and space as intuitive categories of a mind that allow it to make associations between other objects. But that's a different trajectory. Anyway, let me try not losing the thread of what it is, what is the focus of this presentation. The categories utilized here would hence be a productive synthesis of the subject's ref reflection, unlike perhaps a circular presupposing of the subject itself. This constitution of the subject, as it were, is readily apparent. For those of you with the inclination in the first few chapters of Hegel's phenomenology, where he does in some ways deal with how perception and the questioning and the inadequacy of perception create the possibility, the gap, the space for the subject to arise. Yet it is to the credit of the author to lay bare the problem in lay terms which an introduction is meant for. Yet the focus of the text remains the relation of the subject to power, which is the mechanism identified by Butler via which the subject secures its own constitution via subordination. 
In other words, the dependency of the subject on power, a decidedly Foucauldian register. However, there is a way in which this same story may be written as one of debt. When Butler writes, for example, that any effort to oppose that subordination will necessarily presuppose and re-invoke it, we see how the subject, notwithstanding the erasure of its own position in narrating its genesis, has yet to acknowledge that genesis to reiterate that constitutive subordination which it seeks to resist. Now this was a quote. Oh sorry, I, uh, let me clarify where this quote ends. Any effort to oppose that subordination will necessarily presuppose and re-invoke it. And I think here Butler does seek to place within the subject something like a constitutive, not merely a constitutive resistance, but a determinate resistance, a determinate resistance to a certain direction or perhaps a vector from a certain direction. And in this sense, we start begin to conceive the subject as a certain kind of product, as a product of a place, as a site of resistance which sought some kind of trajectory out of a situation. Something akin to a narrative emerges, something perhaps embryonic. Here, however, the subject of the book is made clear as we are pointed to the difference between power as a condition of the subject and power as what the subject wields. And I think we do recognize that in these movements, the beginning of a sense of agency of oneself. Here it is helpful to place my own reservations over the construction of such a category seemingly without predication itself, beyond its utility either in constituting the subject or as utilized by the subject, an instrumentalist account in either turn, which is of course the rather base or opaque or non-descriptive category of power. There is an acknowledgement that the power that initiates a subject fails to remain contiguous with the power that is the subject's agency. It seems, actually seems to be referred to here is the difference between an appointing authority or one which is involved in the entrusting of a charge and the manner the latter may be utilized by, the sub, by a subject themselves. And I think there's a very important difference that the professor and the author Judith Butler does make here. What we really seem to be getting at here is a difference, not so much regarding the means via which a subject wields their agency or was a product of a subordination to it as between constitutive and constituted power. An important demarcation which among others Frederick Jameson does make. Power is as subordination, a set of conditions that precedes the subject, effecting and subordinating the subject from the outside. This form formulation falters, however, when we consider that there is no subject prior to this effect. Earlier, this is a quote by the way, the power to the, uh, how it's constituted. Earlier we did not, we did notice, however, a certain split 
which the subject effectuates in themselves, in the act of their narration, a bearing witness to a certain genesis, as it were. In offering an account of its genesis, the position which a subject speaks from seems to be one such. Yet, if in their constitution we were to follow Butler in acknowledging a subordination upon which the subject is or becomes contingent on, the constitution of a subject may be narrated as an account of this subordination, or rather, this subjection. The question I would like to place here is one regarding the subject and not of power. The subject who can freely account of its own constitution, or subjection if you prefer, may, in the transparency of such an act, pass from the position of a subject who was a product of power as subordination externally determined. This third position of the subject, as it were, not of a subordinating power, not as a subject of subordination, but one who can account for such a process, perhaps in the form of a, nar of a narrative, is of interest to us. Yet the focus of the text, as the title suggests, is not the subject, which may better be introduced in a text such as Badiou's theory of the subject. The focus of the text under consideration is power, and here it posits a duality. Power as acting on the subject and power acted by the subject. I quote, there is no conceptual transition to be made in power here. What appears as a transition is a splitting, perhaps via subordination, and reversal of the subject itself, perhaps analogous to the moment when the subject realizes its dependency on the subordination to exercise power. To mitigate the instrumentality which characterizes the relation between power and the subject, a new site of agency is posited. Agency is the assumption of a purpose unintended by power, one that could not have been derived logically or historically, that operates in a relation of contingency and reversal to the power that makes it possible. However, would not such a characterization of agency, which turns on power as it were, strip agency of its power to do so? Or rather, can not the agency in question take up terms and posit them with its own force. The reversal which Butler remarks upon earlier seems to be minimized to a tokenistic critique. Tokenistic because the object of its critique, power, perhaps of the constitutive kind, is not predicated in any way. The result, a negation without determination. Or, to contemporize the situation with another American example from music, when DJ Snake and Lil, and Lil John demand in their famous rap song, Turn Down For What, they perhaps, not unlike the subject of Judith Butler's characterization, demand to know not why a rejection was made, i.e. Why was I turned down? But rather, what was picked instead? Why is this question important? 
because the ob because the obfuscation of recognition which forecloses the possibility of understanding utilizes tokenistic oppositions oppositions without depth or substance to avoid confronting not its constitutive power but its constitutive lack here of course i must preface that we begin to start conceiving is a zekian understanding of the subject and i would encourage you to to familiarize yourself with that there is however a sense in which i must place my own reservations regarding the conceptualization of the relation between the subject and power reservations which are not exhausted by pointing out the sheer instrumentality involved why for instance is the subject conceived to be deriving its agency from precisely the power that it opposes this seems to elevate ne rather transcendentalize the category of power to some kind of divinity in whose reflection we pursue our earthly endeavors i e make it into a version of the ineffable one authority signification and extensionality but beyond reproach beyond even dialogue for it is beyond predication and perhaps on a later date we may return to this position to appraise a critique which is now decidedly badewian territory even if cartoonists are killed and painters exiled for their efforts at explications here and in many ways this is an old problem like if you do posit something that is the uh, holy of holies or god or whatever there are n number of problems that any um believing body or church or congregation would find in representations of such a um figure what concerns butler here to not drift too far from the thread is of course rather the regulation of the psyche in question how does the subjection of desire require and institute the desire for subjection this direction however is less glib than it sounds though as we see that the incorporation of norms and the reasoning for this is demanded as an account of the subject in question this i would encourage as a constructive endeavor i mean we'll get to learn about why a certain subject chose to incorporate certain practices and this i believe is the essence of what uh, uh, culture the social sciences is about a more interesting question entailed here is how are we to account for the desire for the norm and the subjection more generally in terms of a prior desire for social existence i think this can be thought of in two discrete ways as well there may there may be something in the norm itself in the practice of a certain norm let's say running in the morning which is favorable for subjects to adopt and there may be a certain recognition of a norm let's say a community which irrespective of whether the norm is good or not someone may want to seek or what what may want to seem to belong to or may want to belong to and that may be a motivation why they seek to adopt a practice yet my point is both of these would work in the constitution of a certain um body a social body there are problematic positions brought forth here most noticeably quote within subjection the price of existence is subordination 
this seems to conflate two entirely discrete matters, one semantic and the other existential. Were we to find a novel ontology in the text, I would be willing to reassess my position. Let me repeat that. Within subjection, the price of existence is subordination. This seems to conflate two entirely discrete matters, existence and subordination, to my mind. One semantic and the other existential. Were we to find a novel ontology which can perhaps spell out the relation between this? In the text, I would be willing to reassess my position. This productivist dimension in desire, however, the adoption of practices, for example, following the loose is what is of interest to us. Here, Butler does insist on the terms of self-reflexivity. There are markings of disciplinarian reflection here. In, in order to curb desire, one makes of oneself an object of reflection. This is offered as an account of producing one's own alterity. There may even be traces here of a certain kind of melancholia which inaugurates the subject, which is posited as constitutive of the subject, of the subject's pouvoir. Yet here I will limit my Freudian predilections. Loss, however, the metaphoric genus to the melancholic species, is an act of crafting one's situation linguistically, a formulation of the subject as well, and indeed we do learn a lot about a subject in considering the place of loss in its formation. The far more interesting proposition in such hermeneutics, and I believe this would be a section which is better read and I will leave the text in question in the description. The far more interesting proposition in such hermeneutics would be, quote, the foreclosure which constitutes an unknowability which the subject cannot endure. Hmm. In repeating, the far more interesting proposition in such hermeneutics would be the foreclosure which constitutes an unknowability without which the subject cannot endure. And I guess here we do step properly into the sphere which begins to start thinking of the subject as a fiction, the a fiction which perhaps, quote unquote, an ego tells itself about the person in question, a people may, const may say about themselves something like a founding myth and things of that nature. But they, it may also be subjects of trauma, repressed memories, hidden narratives, silenced accounts and uh, fudged papers. The loss of the ability to love, for instance, predicating certain overdetermined relations. Let me just read this section out in its entirety once. Loss, however, the metaphoric genus to the melancholic species, in an act of crafting one's situation linguistically, a formation of the subject as well, and indeed, we do learn a lot about a subject in considering the place of the loss in its formation. And I believe this is a way in which we can escape from some sort of generalization using the melancholic aspect itself. The far more interesting proposition in such hermeneutics would be the foreclosure which constitutes an unknowability without which the subject cannot endure. 
the loss of the ability to love, for instance, predicating certain overdetermined relations. Fascinating configurations do emerge here, such as guilt being a way in which a subject safeguards the object of love from violence, which may be obliterating, such as in the work of Melanie Klein. Here, guilt is posited as a protective screen which preserves the object from one's own aggression. Indeed, this does seem knotted to the alluring proposition of the attempt to vanquish one's object of love. Indeed, we would do well to remember here that object relations in the psyche stand in for the other, and a therapeutic reading often yields a knotted association between the desire to vanquish the dead other and a marking of that other as the threat of death. A challenge unacknowledged by the introduction of this text is, let us call it a theoretical dilemma. If desire, as Spinoza states, is always the desire to persist in one's own being. How are we to understand the Lacanian position of desire always being the desire of the other? This is a question we are informed that will only be played out within the risky terms of social life. Something that a political economist would do well to remember here is that our object relations will, in the end, define how our commerce is perceived, even if they are in the terms of the characterization of contractual relations. Of course, in most scenarios, these presented propositions would have to be informalized. The delectable question we are left with is, is there a way to affirm complicity as the basis of political agency, a direction I do not encourage. I believe that there is a value to be sought in the formalization of relations. It creates for the possibility of accountability for institutional acknowledgements, dependencies, and checks and balances, and so on. Yet the other half of the question, or the other question, uh, is there a way to affirm complicity as the basis of political agency, yet insist that political agency may do more than reiterate the conditions of subordination? This seems to be, in some ways, the closing of the introduction. And I would like to state briefly how, for example, a text written in 1997 were to be able to hear in those early moorings the idea that, for example, rumor or gossip uh, in an era prior to Twitter would emerge as forms of subject formation, as a way in which agency operates through complicity. And this does raise possibilities, but it also presents um, problems which may not be as new as they may present themselves to be. The other, the, the other half of this, if you prefer, uh, having created, or rather let's acknowledge it, having created this kind of complicity, and let us call it a political subject, which can be characterized in complicities, which I think is like decidedly uh, French to be metaphoric, what can this bond or what can this subject or association do apart from reiterate the conditions of its own subordination or can it do something apart from that this i think would require a slightly closer investigation regarding the relations in question but from my point of view the text in question which i do intend to continue reading 
and maybe present something similar in terms of notes of the first chapter. I will leave the text which I have presented here without my interruptions in the description for you to read if you would like to. And if you do have any comments, observations, um, critiques regarding the form of presentation, I would gladly welcome them. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Have a good evening. A good day rather.